Yeah. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started with our panel on standards and eco labels. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session, and we're going to talk about uh, some activities in the purchasing arena. Uh, about how to define sustainable purchasing. <laughs> it seems that everyone wants to be considered sustainable this day and age, and so exactly what they mean by that, and, and how that's determined of some of the things that we will talk about. There are some existing standards, uh, as well as some standards that are under development that address how uh, and what constitutes a sustainable product. Uh, there are many third-party labels uh, in the marketplace, and. Uh, you can see the slide up here and at that third tier below gives you some samples of some of those eco-labels. And these eco-labels are playing a role in helping buyers identify sustainable attributes of products. Many of the sustainability standards and eco-labels are multi-attribute based and that is they look at more than uh, one environmental or health impact or characteristics. Some also consider economic characteristics as well as social uh, attributes of the ingredient sourcing and, and of the manufacturing process. In our panel today, we're going to explore some of these uh, sustainable product standards. We're going to talk a little bit about how they're being developed and how they're used to define what is considered sustainable and the latest trends and some of uh, the roles these standards and labels are playing in actual purchasing decisions and in particular uh, with federal purchasing. We also want to discuss how the trends in the use of standards and eco-labels identify sustainable products that could affect bio-based products. Uh, in addition to having renewable content, we know that many bio-based products have a range of other positive attributes that are more sustainable environmental and health attributes such as low VOC content, less hazardous ingredients, and rapid biodegradability. So I'm happy uh, to have joining me on the panel today, Porter Glock and Jeff Bradley. And at this time, I will go ahead and introduce uh, both of them. Porter is a procurement analyst with the Office of Management and Budgets Office of Federal Procurement Policy, or OFPP. He started at that agency as part of a Presidential Management Fellows rotation in April of 2014 and accepted a permanent position that July. Porter's portfolio at OFPP includes sustainable procurement, cybersecurity, and customer satisfaction, among other issues. Prior to joining OFPP, Porter worked in the Treasury's Office of the Procurement Executive and DHS's Office of Procurement Operations. He received his JD cum laude from George Mason University School of Law and his BS in Environmental Policy and Planning from Virginia Tech. <clears throat> He's a member of the Virginia State Bar and he holds a FACC Level 2 certification for those of you who are in the federal acquisition workforce. And he's also a return Peace Corps volunteer serving in Fiji from 2006 to 2008. Jeff Bradley to my left is the manager of forestry and wood products policy at the American Forest and Paper Association. He works on forest certification, green buildings, and sustainability issues. He is a former AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer. Jeff has a BA from Allegheny College in Environmental Studies, and he has been with AF and PA for eight years. Before we begin with our panel members, I would like to mention a few of the overarching standards uh, currently being developed by ASTM International. And you see ASTM on the slide uh, near the top. ASTM, uh, ISO, and ANSI are all standard development organizations, ISO being an international organization. And we're aware of at least four standards that ASTM, uh, or four committees that they have that are potential relevance to bio-based products at this time. There may be more, but these are the ones that we have identified uh, today. E48 is a committee on bioenergy and industrial chemicals from biomass. E60 is a committee on sustainability. E62 is a committee on industrial biotechnology. And D20 is a committee on, on plastics. And so all of these 
uh, committees are dealing with definitions of sustainability and also dealing with issues that might impact uh, bio-based products uh, once they are developed. A lot of times standards borrow definitions from other standards rather than uh, reinventing the wheel every time. So it's important to know what's happening in this arena. There's more information on these particular uh, committees as well as other work uh, by independent standard setting organizations and that's in the background material that's posted on the website that was part of the pre-reading uh, package. Porter, let's begin uh, with a question uh, for you. Uh, in March of 2015, President Obama issued the Executive Order 13693 entitled Planning for Federal Sustainability in the Next Decade. And then that was followed in June of that year by implementing instructions for the executive order, which were issued by the White House Council of Environmental Quality. Could you provide us with an overview of how the Section 3 of that order addresses the use of standards and labels in the federal purchasing decisions? Uh, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you may know, the uh, U.S. government is the largest purchaser in the world. Uh, last fiscal year, four hundred. $38 billion in contract spending. Um, so we buy a lot of stuff. Uh, the executive order signed last year was an attempt to be more sustainable. I mean, the, the key point of Section 3 is to promote sustainable acquisitions to the maximum extent practical. Um, those who know our large procurement spend also know we're very decentralized in our buys, right? We have numerous contracting officers, numerous contracting offices spread across uh, all federal facilities around the world. So Section 3 tries to lay out a framework of, of purchasing, purchasing more sustainably. First, and what remains is buying sustainable through statutory mandates such as bio-based. This is what's been the law, continues to be the law, and the number one stop, which contracting officers are already very familiar with. Regulations have been in the far as discussed earlier this morning. This is an area where we're pretty familiar with and uh, we've done good work and are continuing to do good work Randall earlier from USDA talked about the FPDS data. Uh, as you dig into it, you'll see year over year the bio-based and the environmental uh, clauses are growing in use across federal spending, which is a good thing. We need to continue that trend. Uh, but beyond those statutory mandates, the uh, EO Section 3 looks towards the EPA recommended and EPA uh, eco labels. Uh, and I, once we get away from the statutory requirements, I think it's always important to realize contracting officers are sort of jacks of all trades. It's very rare to have a specialized contracting officer in, in one field. So they need help to understand what they're buying, understand what labels mean. That's where these EPA uh, eco labels and EPA recommended labels come into play. Uh, they need help understanding what they're buying, if the label's a value or not. And these EPA recommendations help them assess whether the products meet their agency's sustainability goals based on their mission needs, based on their requirements, right? Uh, the EO only applies to the maximum extent practical. The mission comes first, so uh, the product has to meet the mission need. So you have the statutory requirement, EPA recommendations. The third step in the EO, it also allows for, uh, if there is no specification standard or label recommended by EPA, an agency can elect to use an open or voluntary standard in procurement. So it's the third step in the process and must be considered and if there's a re applicable voluntary standard which will help them get to their uh, sustainability goals, they should use it. Um, I have a list of standards up here. A lot of, uh, I guess this is a, we had a list of uh, labels before, and a lot of these are multi-attribute multi labels. And just like, like consumers in the marketplace, contracting officers, some of these labels will be helpful. Some of these multi-attribute labels can be very helpful. Some of them may not be. And it's, it's really our goal, the policy, the training to start educate, as well as through the EPA labeling uh, techniques, to start educating contracting officers on, on the means on these and how they can benefit their uh, sustainable procurement plans. Part of, I want to ask a follow-up question. On the screen up here, I've, I've put a copy of some of the EPA's interim recommendations on standards and eco-labels. <clears throat> these interim recommendations were published in September of last year, and they have the three categories we ex excerpted from uh, the Federal Register notice there. Uh, the ones that the statutory requirements and then the additional EPA requirements and then the third category you mentioned. Could you sort of explain a little, in a little more depth about uh, 
these recommendations and how agency federal agencies should look at the three bins? Sure. Um, well, let me start off by saying these are the EPA guidelines, so I, I'm not the best equipped to, to speak to them, but and there is a lot of confusion in this area. Uh, so we're, we need to do some work to clarify this. Uh, the second column, the applicable statutory requirements, as mentioned earlier, are the requirements that are really understood by our contracting officers currently. These are in the FAR, they use, they use these. But the EO sort of pushes us to the other two columns. Applicable EPA eco-labels, and other EPA recommended standards or eco labels. Obviously, statutory requirements must be done. Uh, the applicable EPA labels, if there is one, such as the carpet uh, cleaners, glass, multi purpose cleaners, if there's an EPA label, that should also be done as well here at Saver Choice. But other EPA recommended standards and eco labels, um, these must be investigated and should be used if applicable to your procurement, your requirement needs. Uh, there is some confusion in this area, and we need to work at OMB with uh, CEQ, this Council of Environmental Quality at the White House, as well as EPA sort of clarify uh, the hierarchy <coughs> or, or how we see these when they must be done. But I do think it's important to, to understand and go back to the contracting officers who are keenly aware of their statutory and legal requirements uh, versus policy and regulation, where it can be a little more confusing. So our goal needs to be to, to clarify this to some degree. Um, but much like consumers in the supermarket, these labels help CEOs determine the product they need in, a, in, in an area where they may be uneducated. Much like we are as consumers, we buy a certain product over another based on a label. Um, EPA guidelines hope to clarify that for the CEOs. CEOs. So uh, that's really the best way I'm looking at this column, but I do think there's some confusion here that we need to work on clarifying. Well, thanks, Porter, and I appreciate your trying to answer that for us. I know there is a lot of controversy around it, or confusion may be a better word, uh, because in some of uh, our discussions with EPA uh, and some of their staff, there's the understanding, um, at least by some, that a product would need to have all three. Uh, for example, with the cleaner, you would have to have the bio preferred or be uh, a preferred product there, and then have the safer choice, and then perhaps the green seal label as well. And that seems somewhat contradictory, but then, uh, you know, these are voluntary and, and recommendations, so it remains to be seen, I think, and interpreted as to how they will be implemented by the different federal agencies, whether, you know, mandatory or just something you have to consider and look at and yeah. that kind of thing. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think it's also fair um, that we haven't heard from contracting offices on the ground in this problem. Right. It's interesting when a you know, policy is written, the uh, executive order comes out, uh, there are obviously many instructions to help clarify ambiguities and clarify implementation. Uh, but especially in our office, we try to help the contracting officers on the, on the ground. If they complain or bring up confusion to our level, we do our best to clarify it. Thus far, we've not heard those ground level complaints, but I, I, I know in the vendor community there, there's certainly a confusion as well in the policy level, so we do need to work to clarify that. So I think that's a fair assessment of the, uh, the status. Well, thank you. I appreciate your working with us and, and hearing us out on that, and some of the, you in the audience may have questions uh, later about that. Uh, recently, we know that the Office of Manage Management and Budget, your office, issued revisions to Circular 119A, and this particular cir circular provides guidance on the federal use of voluntary consensus standards in, in accordance with the requirements of a statute, uh, which is called the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act, or NTTAA. Can you briefly tell us about what the circular does and how it might affect federal agency procurement authority, and, and then also how it affects federal agencies' participation in the actual development of third-party standards? Sure. Um, in short, the circular requires that all agency standards uh, use standards developed by voluntary consensus bodies as opposed to government unique standards, less than consistent with law or otherwise impractical. Uh, coming from the procurement side of the House, uh, one experience we've recently had with this, there's a proposed rule out to amend the federal access and regulation to strip it of all references to DUNS numbers, Dun and Bradstreet numbers. Those of you who do business with the federal government are very familiar with DUNS. It's a proprietary uh, system of registering corporate addresses for registering that's required to do business with the government. Recognizing that this is not required by statute, 
and that is proprietary standards that businesses have to pay into to get a number to register with us, increasing their cost, increasing our cost. At the same time that uh, intended innovation, right? If there's someone else with a better way of doing this, they're not going to come to the marketplace because we've uh, anointed one source as the end all be all. Uh, recognizing those two concerns, we've gone to scrub the proprietary standard from the regulations themselves. This isn't to say they're still not useful, still not available to be used, and currently is really the only way to do it. But by removing those the terminology, the standard from the regulations, we allow voluntary consistent standards, which may be in brewing to come up, provide incentives for others to provide an alternative to us or to the marketplace. And um, I wasn't involved in the authoring or the revision, the 119, uh, the circular, but from our perspective, those are the two factors we go to uh, looking at the development of voluntary standards. Unless you by statute, we don't want to anoint a source as being the end-all, be-all, which would increase costs for both, both the vendors and us, and inhibit uh, innovation and others from developing standards. So those are our major concerns, and I think it, it plays into the, the concerns here. What about the participation of federal employees in developing standards, some of these third-party standards? Do you have any thoughts on that? Or it looked like in reading the circular that that was increased a little bit. That may not be the case, but um, that's that's sort of the way it appeared to my reading. Yeah, in my understanding too, like for example, the uh, EPA, their guidelines on uh, assessing environmental effectiveness for standards. Um, the STRAP guidelines for procurement talks about agencies can sort of assess voluntary standards on their own, even if they haven't been uh, assessed by the EPA, and bring those findings to the EPA so they can investigate and say, you know, are these worthy, are these, these say what they're supposed to do, and then uh, act on them accordingly, either putting them on the recommended list or not. Um, I know if a number of agencies do it, EPA will prioritize their investigation of those labels to to uh, get more information across the government as a whole, but that's where I see the uh, government side being more involved. Okay, th thank you. Um, I know on a couple of those ASTM committees that I've worked on, EPA has participated uh, in those, and I'm not as familiar with some of the other agencies' participation as I am with that. Before we move away from some of the uh, federal ac actions that are occurring that might impact sustainability, uh, Jeff, um, you're aware that prior to the executive order that we were talking about, that EPA issued some draft guidelines uh, for environmental performance standards and eco labels. In addition to these, uh, these were prior to the, the list of interim recommendations. And we're aware that EPA is conducting a pilot uh, based on those guidelines or using those draft guidelines to assess some standards and eco labels in three product categories: one, furniture, flooring and paints, coatings, and paint removers. Uh, I think you're participating in that pilot process, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process and your perspective on it. Sure, I can give some just brief comments from uh, my perspective. And uh, I'll note that while I work for the American Forest and Paper Association, for this particular pilot process, I was there uh, for the American Wood Council, which is another organization that I also work for. Um, and the American Wood Council represents um, lumber, uh, OSB, and engineered wood product producers, the folks that uh, make construction <coughs> for the most part. Um, as, as part of the uh, pilot process, there were uh, four committees set up. There were the three for the different pilot groups that uh, Sally mentioned, and then there was a fourth for the governance committee, which was looking at the process overall, and that's the, uh, that's the committee that I participated in. Um, the task of this committee, along with the others, was to take the, uh, the basic uh, sort of guidance criteria that EPA had previously published in the Federal Register as uh, draft guidance and work on creating indicators for those, uh, for those criteria that a, uh, that a standards developer could then used to uh, measure up against their, uh, their, their standard or eco label that, that was out there. So um, that process took probably, it was about nine months from the start up until <coughs> the point which the uh, document then went into the Federal Register. 
um, for uh, for standard Eagle label uh, owners to then submit their uh, standards or Eagle labels to be uh, tested up against the uh, draft criteria and, uh, and the indicators that were created for that. Um, the, the criteria and, and indicators that were developed were based pretty closely off of the OMP 119 uh, criteria. There were some changes to that. Um, I, I can't say that from uh, from my perspective, I was completely thrilled with everything in there, and I think that you know, there's a lot of questions about where the uh, where the process is going and, and how this is going to work in the real world that are that are still out there. Do you think that I mean, you may not be able to answer this yet, but do you think EPA is moving towards like from the pilot to putting something in place that would evaluate? Um, Eco-labels on an ongoing basis? Yes, I, I can say I can say EPA is definitely looking at it. Um, in conversations <coughs> with the agency, they've said that after this pilot process is over, they're going to figure out the next steps forward. It doesn't sound like there is a uh, cut and dry process after the pilot's been finished, and it's also not clear what what's going to happen with the results from the pilot this time. Um, for, for right now, these interim recommendations that are out are um, all that's going to be put out. Um, I, I think from the, from, the perspective, from the interim recommendation perspective, I, I'd also just add that I was, a, I was a bit disappointed that those hit the street with uh, no public input that I, I'm aware of, and a lot of these um, interim recommendations came from uh, other agencies' internal uh, programs that were not um, mandatory guidance, if you will, depending on who you talk to at OMB or CEQ or EPA in terms of how these are going to be interpreted. But uh, I think the, the process there was, was something that, that uh, could have been improved. Have they mentioned a, a future public process or public comment process on those or before they go final for, for the recommendations on the eco labels? The, the, my understanding, and this is again based on what folks at the agency have, have said to me, is that the uh, these interim recommendations are going to be in place up until the uh, whatever comes of the pilot process is implemented. So I, I think the, uh, the vision when this pilot process started was for there to be these uh, individual committees set up for every product category and for uh, somewhat individualized indicators to be put together for each product category <coughs> that uh, would then be used to, um, uh, I guess, Judge how the uh, standards and equal labels in that product category do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that process is still evolving. Okay, well, thanks. That's fair. That sounds almost like a, a another layer on top of a third party standard, if you will, or once those are in, in place. But we'll have to watch and see how that turns out. You have a lot of experience dealing with specific. Um, labels relevant to the forest products industry. I was wondering if you could talk briefly about some of those labels uh, and the implications for forest products. Yeah, so so, so the uh, forest products industry has been using standards and eco labels for quite some time. I think that we're probably one of the uh, pioneers in the space. Um, we have the uh, a couple that are pretty well known, the Forest Stewardship Council, the uh, Sustainable Forestry Initiative are uh, two eco labels that are used here in the U.S. Um, they are systems that uh, are both certifiers of forest land. Uh, so there's there are auditors that go out and will certify um, companies' forest lands and uh, determine that best management practices are occurring, that uh, sustainable harvest is occurring. Um, that impacts the water and wildlife are minimized, uh, the whole breadth of, uh, of different uh, 
criteria and indicators are, uh, are taken care of. Um, those, those are the two systems that are predominantly used in the U.S. Um, I'd also add that there's one called the Program for the Endorsement of Forest Certification Systems, PEFC, that is uh, a little more, well more known uh, over in Europe and uh, a good deal of uh, AFK members who sell into the European market also use that label for uh, recognition. The uh, SFI label is not as well known there. Um, the, uh, the different systems have evolved in different tracts. Uh, the uh, FSC system was one that was originally started by uh, WWF. Um, SFI was originally started by AFPPA. Um, the uh, SFI system went uh, into a 501c3 in 2007, so it's uh, coming up on 10 years being fully independent. Um, all of these systems have, uh, have requirements for uh, social, <coughs> environmental, and some degree economic uh, impacts, and so they're, they're pretty broad, and uh, we really think they, uh, they show the sustainability of our industry. Can you tell us a little bit about the time it takes to get a label and maybe some indication of the cost and and do you are these audits ongoing or are they annual or you can keep a label for so long something about that process sure um i'm probably going to leave the cost part aside for, because i work for an association okay talk about those. That's, that's fair um i i will say that uh they are uh, ongoing, so when it comes to our mills, our mills all have chain of custody certificates um, that let them pass on the claims to uh, their customers, and they they also um, <coughs> are are what our members use to track the uh, certified content that's going through them. Um, there are some other requirements that the mills have to perform, such as uh, some of the social requirements and which are around labor. Um, and the, uh, the audits for those are generally yearly. They come once a year. Um, our members have gotten very good at uh, being fairly efficient with them. Um, some of the systems allow for uh, those, those chain of custody certificates to span across multiple facilities. Some do not allow that. I, I think most of them are moving towards a multi-facility approach because it's a lot more efficient and it helps our, uh, our folks with paperwork and the, uh, and the uh, manpower that sometimes needed to go into these. I know that some <coughs> of our, our larger uh, members, you know, they do have dedicated staff that work on forest certification issues, and that's you know, their full-time day job. They, uh, they do put some serious time and, and energy in terms of the standards themselves, who actually develops what the indicators are and develops the standard? You mentioned, uh, for example, that AFMPA was um, behind the SFI, World Wildlife Fund behind the FSC, but um, is it a group of people? Can you talk a little bit about that process? And sure. Just in general terms. In, in general terms, um, there's and, and this is, goes beyond forest certification. Um, we also work on a, a few other standards and eco labels. But uh, they, the uh, interested parties in getting a standard going will come together. You'll probably get a secretary as someone that's going to manage the group and uh, ensure the, the process, whatever the process is, is followed. Um, and then you will go about soliciting members for that committee. Um, SFI, FSC, uh, and um, this is also true in the, in the uh, ANSI world as well, but usually there's a, a balance test of some sort uh, for SFI and FSC. There are three chambers that are balanced equally. Uh, one is social, that makes up uh, labor usually. Uh, one is environmental, which makes up the uh, environmental groups such as WWF or the Nature Conservancy or, or what have you. Uh, and then there's the economic chamber, which is less the manufacturers as well as uh, landowners. Um, and so all those those folks are the people around the table that are hammering out the details of the standard. Usually, those that group will get together, come up with a product, uh, and they will 
they will put it out for public comment. Uh, it goes out to a uh, wide variety of people with ANSI, you have ANSI standards action with uh, ISO, there's another process for that. Um, comments come back, they're addressed, if the standard doesn't change too much, it uh, can be finalized. If there are substantive changes, usually there'd be another round of public comment, and then it uh, then it's the street. So if, if someone wanted to comment on some of these standards or find out which ones that are coming out that might impact their industry or their products, um,